Hi, this is Pete Saronis with part two of my conversation with Brian Durden, Staff Solutions Architect at Rancher Government. In part one, Brian helped us understand Kubernetes versus containers, their role at the tactical edge and the connection to edge computing. Today, we tackle tactics and implementation, including with AI and machine learning ops, as Brian explains what it takes to implement Kubernetes at the tactical edge. Bringing it back to maybe the, the, the buzzwords in, in, in most parts of the world, artificial intelligence. Oh, Everybody yeah. knows it's here, the integration of it. Can you speak to that integration that is important and critical and how Kubernetes can support it and specifically Rancher solutions? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, AI is definitely one of my, my favorite subjects. Um, there, there's several parts to that. So the way you... The, the beauty of Kubernetes, and I'm a Kubernetes zealot, and I'm sure everyone will, will agree with that, that knows me. Um, Kubernetes sees things like GPUs and memory and compute and things like that. It sees it all as the same thing. It's just another resource. And using a combination of labels um, and also resource counts, Kubernetes can intelligently figure out where workloads need to run. So when you create a Kubernetes cluster, which is comprised of, say, we'll say 10 nodes as an example, Maybe two of those nodes have GPUs attached to them that can do advanced AI modeling and, and running through like tensors and, and PyTorch and things like that to create models. Um, when you run workloads on this cluster, not all of them may want to consume those GPUs. They may just be regular old services. Maybe it's Prometheus that's exporting metrics and that kind of thing. Uh, but if you are running GPUs, you want your containers that need those resources to be mapped to the nodes that, are, that have the GPUs available locally. So Kubernetes in general provides this capability just kind of a natural way and in a pattern. And because of the way Rancher is set up, we ensure that the, the mission of our customers in the U.S. government are the first-class citizens uh, for what drives our priorities and things like that. So we know AI and ML and ML ops are like right there at the, the top list of the priority. So things like that are kind of uh, baked into the way things work. So as an example... Uh, ARCAE2, which is our Kubernetes distribution, uh, was formerly called ARCAE Government. We developed it in collaboration with Platform One. Um, within ARCAE2, uh, well, within normal Kubernetes, typically to set up the NVIDIA drivers and the operator and everything to map those GPUs to the Kubernetes nodes is normally this, um, I wouldn't call it a Rube Goldberg machine, but there's, there's some steps in there. Um, ARCAE2 makes it exceedingly simple all you have to do is have RKE2 up and running on top of a node with the GPU, install the NVIDIA operator, and bam, you're done. It automatically does all the applications. And, and the real meat and potatoes under the eighth is making all the container D configurations that have to happen so that it's able to use the NVIDIA runtime as opposed to the normal container D runtime. Um, that's all automatic. Um, and that's baked into RKE2, and you get that for free. It's just a, a feature that comes with it. Um, that, that's kind of an example of, of where we're going. Um, and it go further on that, one of the other things that we're trying to do is I'm in routine uh, conversation with uh, what I call, uh, I don't want to call them think tanks, but they're out there on the forefront and they know ML ops like really well. And I have learned over the last six months to a year that the word ML ops is another one of those buzzword bingo words that gets tossed around that a lot of folks really don't understand. Um, they think ML ops is just running a model and getting an output from an AI perspective. And it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, the best analogy that I can describe is when we look at CI CD pipelines, um, say for applications that are needing to get built. The apps are built, they're tested. Um, maybe it broke the test, it has to repeat the build again and then feed it through the pipeline. And then it goes into either a bucket or a, a waiting lane or something like that. And it gets pulled into a cluster to be run, either maybe in staging or production. Pipelines can get very complicated. Um, ML ops in the same way it can get equally or even more complicated because what happens is these processes, uh, they're feeding all kinds of sensor data. So if we look at JADC2 and the way that's going to work, they're pulling sensor data from like all over the place and they're bringing that data down uh, into their Kubernetes clusters. They're crunching it through GPUs and creating model data based upon whatever they're analyzing. Well, those models are not, they're not only not static, 
but because they, they may evolve over time. But those models themselves can feed into other models. So now you have not only this parallel model of creation, but now you have this any any mapping to where models can feed into models um, and then create certain types of output that's fed into whatever is consuming the information, whether it's general purpose AI or it's very specific filtered information. Um, that's MLOps. That's the kind of thing that we're trying to embrace and, uh, and enable with the Rancher stack. Um, and we have partners that are already running uh, technology and running applications that can do these types of things. So, um, yeah, great question. I very much enjoyed this topic. Yeah, well, I, it's obvious and, and the past and it's <laughs> infectious, my friend. And you taught me a couple things there, which has, you know, 10 questions out of my brain. We don't have enough to answer that. But <laughs> let, let's, let's take that AI and the promise and the vision. And that's clearly something in your DNA and at Rancher as well. You're thinking, you know, where is the puck going to use that sports analogy? And, uh, you know, uh, we talked about this uh, recently um, with some folks that, that I was with in government around the internet of battlefield things. You hit mm -hmm. on sensors. You have talked about analytics. I, I think of decisions that need to be made in milliseconds. Uh, think of the power grid, right? Think of our warfighter, of yes. course. Think of uh, tr transportation systems, planes, so they don't intersect in the air. But the use of IoT to connect and integrate various military system sensors and devices to provide real-time data and enhance situational awareness really speaks to me. And I'm just reading from some of my notes as a, a benefit. And all of what you've described, the architecture, and that's where I want to go with the question is, how hard is this to implement? I mean, Brian, you got to have a partner. You know, it's not just plug and play. You're good to go. What are the tips? Top three, four, five, one, two. If you're thinking about this as a federal agency or as defense industrial based entity, you know, what do you have to think about to implement Kubernetes and take advantage of all the benefits you just described? So that's a great question. Uh, the very first thing I would say or do is you really need to scope your problem. Because if you're walking into a situation and you say, I want to solve everything, uh, you're not going to get anywhere. Um, I think outside of like OpenAI, the company, um, they're really the only ones that can do this AI thing at that level and just go in and do everything and anything. We all know chat GPT. But if you're building something specific, you got to scope the problem first. And then once you scope it, you can define it into outcomes and values about the thing that you want to uh, and then from then on, you can begin to find the kind of compute and say GPU resources that you're going to need to be able to deliver that and kind of slice it up into, say, harder requirements versus software requirements. And the further we break this apart, like, uh, where are you going to get that data from? Um, GPU-based workloads need good data. Is this just a data lake sitting in the cloud and you're going to consume it? Then you may not need an edge. But if you are out on the edge, like the very far edge disconnected environments, you need something that's kind of self-sustaining, such as the HCI edge solution that we've been talking about a few times. Being able to use GPUs to, say, pre-crunch and pre-filter data out on the edge prior to feeding it back to HQ, uh, like when you're connected, say, to the mothership or whatever you want to call it, and then send it back kind of pre-filtered, that kind of thing can become very important because the volume of data that is generated uh, out on the edge by all of these sensors and everything that's incoming at once, that all needs to be fed into these AI models, um, it needs to be kind of filtered down because uh, honestly, we just don't have that kind of bandwidth. So it really depends on scope in the problem, uh, defining the values and the outcomes. So you're staying within your lane as a, as a producer of products and solutions, and then deciding where the data is pulled from, where it's going, how it's going to be consumed, things like that. So it's really a scoping problem first to, 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 sit, to circle back, because if you walk in and you try to solve everything at once, you're just going to spin your wheels. Um, and no one's really a Tony Stark here. It's a mythical beast. Um, we're all better together. Um, as long as we kind of focus on what we're good with, uh, we can all you know deliver better products together. I appreciate that. I always think of it as a former federal executive hoping that an uh, you know an industry partner would come in and say, "Not here's what we can do for you." The first question would be, "What problem are you trying to solve?" We do not have cookie cutter. So thanks for letting me put on my old, you know, feeling what you're saying, which is very, very much a lot of awesomeness. Um, and I appreciate that. Scope the problem. The mission is what matters. And we at Rancher can help you with that, that custom, if you will, solution to meet your specific requirement. Okay. Before we do what I love in that parting shot, you know, close us out. We can talk for hours. I just want to emphasize to the audience again, uh, and, and feel free to, uh, you know, just chime in or, or riff off this. Brian, is that, you know, you talked about scoping 
and you know our military, our forces from communications and networking, intelligence, surveillance, cyber warfare, electronic warfare, having autonomous systems, folks, this and these are the type of capabilities that technology can underpin and help save lives. Our defense industrial base is is a critical infrastructure sector and in everything that that Brian has shared today uh, in terms of capability, uh, working with the right partner, scoping the problem, and uh, coming up with a solution to consider is something that clearly I could tell Brian, you and your colleagues at Rancher do seven days a week and twice on Sunday. So that was my long-winded way of letting you think about what your parting shot is. But any comment on that before I uh, ask you to close us out here? All right. So there's a lot there. Uh, the thing is, one of the problems that I always ran into uh, as an engineer, and I was talking with one of my fellow engineers about this problem just earlier, um, is as a senior engineer, you're used to being the the person that solves these problems on your own because uh, you have to be that guy or girl that is able to be self-reliant and self-sustaining because you have no backup. Like if something goes wrong or something's not working, um, you can't go talk to anybody. You got Stack Overflow and maybe Chat GPT now or something, uh, but that's really it. So when you're the senior person on staff, you're the one that people go to for the backup to solve the problem. And when you don't have one, you just got to figure it out. Uh, so it doesn't have to be that way. Um, there's so much specialized knowledge in this industry. And it, even with Kubernetes, as niche as it is, there's there's so many different lanes of work and so many talented folks that are out there. So it's not just from Rancher, uh, but like say MLOps, for instance. Uh, MLOps can be a very complex thing that some companies want to kind of like own themselves, but they're not in the AI space yet. And so they don't understand a lot of the best practices around it. And they, they may be not developing the the best product. There are several great companies out there that are uh, our partners that can do this kind of stuff. And they are much better at these things than I am. In fact, they are far more eloquent about describing the problems and describing the solutions than I can because they know the topic better. And that makes sense, right? We can only learn so much. Nobody's a Tony Stark, as I said before, in this industry. I'm sure there's some folks that think they are, but you got to lean on your friends. Uh, that's my take. Go Iron Man. So bring your partners into stuff. Let's all go solve this problem together. Because like Rancher, we have a great product stack. There's a lot of different uh, pieces to the layer cake that we kind of bring into the table, but we are very cognizant that we're a small cog in a larger machine, a bigger enterprise with bigger solutions. And we are not all going to solve this problem uh, alone. Uh, we need to lean on each other to be able to build the, the mission solution for the customer because the mission is more important. Than not everybody has to go do this alone uh, is the point. Wonderful. And and that's the, it takes a village and the emphasis. And by the way, your humility precedes you. Uh, you know, Tony Stark was not a one man band. We know that, but Brian, I really appreciate that again and, and appreciate your knowledge and your wisdom. Uh, you know, for me, my parting shot is simply, hey, if I'm listening to this or watching this, I'm thinking open government reigns supreme at rancher government, being participatory, collaborative and transparent, public private partnership works. And you, you know, you can't go it alone. So I want to thank you for for very uh, uh, intentional or not expressing that because it resonated with me. And again, I was a former CTO in the federal government at two cabinet level agencies, and this really speaks to your uh, your mantra of being a partner. So uh, do you have any parting shot, closeout comments, something you want to leave with the audience? Yeah. So just a quick one. So when we're talking about our HCI Edge solution, uh, and if you've not read the white paper, I highly recommend it. Um, if you've had to solve these problems before, uh, in a nutshell, what we're able to do is go one layer deeper than what typical automation allows for these environments because of what Harvester is and the, 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 the place it is positioned. So we can now deploy like an entire infrastructure and application layer from a single YAML file. Uh, you can describe an entire environment uh, as a whole uh, as code. Uh, which is exceptionally powerful for a lot of different reasons. And it would take a, a, an hour just to go talk about all the benefits that a, that actually would deliver. But imagine being able to define your entire environment from code. Um, and I don't mean like just typical cloud stuff that you might throw in AWS, like, hey, here's my virtual machines. Here's some services I'm spinning up. I'm talking about everything from the bare metal in a data center or out on an edge device. Um, that That's a very compelling thing, I think. Um, and that's the kind of idea that we're trying to leverage and enable. Um, and if you want to see this demonstrated, please talk to me. I would love to talk your ear off about this topic. I'm very passionate about the technology. I love diving in deep and just showing everybody everything. I'm a big open source and open standards proponent. So I'm all about cooperation 
and learning new stuff because I'm sure there's all kinds of things that people can teach me as well. Um, I'm very excited about the topic, so please reach out to me. Thank you, Brian Durden, Staff Solutions Architect, Rancher Government. I can't wait to talk to you again soon, my friend. Thanks, Pete. I really appreciate it.